1941. Americans were listening to Glenn Miller and the Andrews sisters. Manufacturers were disappointed in the sales of the latest technology, something called television. You could buy a loaf of bread for eight cents. A dollar would get you about eight gallons of gas. If you worked hard, you could make $35 a week, and the world was at war. The recently completed Comanche Indian Census lists 5,015 men, women, and children by name. 17 young Comanche men, all single, volunteer for the Army. Some of them quit high school to join their friends. Born in the United States, yet they weren't U.S. citizens until the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. Still, they love their country. They are proud, eager, and willing to serve, to fight, and to die to defend the United States. The 17 grew up speaking Comanche, English was their second language. They were punished for using their native tongue. Some at Indian boarding schools called it a dirty language. But the Army needed these young men for a special mission. They were hand-picked, known forever as code talkers. They would use the unwritten language handed down from one Comanche to the next for generations to help defeat the Germans. When you're in the Army, you do as you're told, do everything the Army way. But not this time. The Comanche code talkers were left to devise their own code, a code the Germans would never break. In 1942, one of the code talkers, 19-year-old Larry Sawpity, chose to chronicle his army experience in a diary, an entry every day. Sawpity and the other code talkers were training in 42. At the time, they didn't know that they would participate in one of the largest amphibious military assaults in history, landing on Utah Beach during the Normandy invasion. Only a handful of people have heard these words until now. Dear Diary, whatever secrets of mine that I hold within will be ceremoniously and jealously guarded be it understood that the usual procedure is kept in mind when I am writing the results of the day. Here I will deposit some of the sweet memories which I do not dare commit to remember, for fear of losing those fleeting moments forever. January 1st, 1942. It's been a good day, just gold bricked all morning and read Life magazine. Parker paid Cass one smacker to work his last shift from 4 to 6 p.m. Taxi and I are going to town tonight. I cleared $28.25 of my pay yesterday. January 26, 1942. I've been teasing Holder about his old gals. We had machine gun instructions and motor inspections at 4.30 this afternoon. I took pictures with Parker and Junior. Not much activity today. Very dull, very dull. February 22, 1942. We had a pretty good dinner. I played pool with Burkett for a while and then went to the movies with Charles. We saw You're in the Army Now and then went to the canteen with Parker. Karina thinks he's going to put a fast one over on me, but wait and see who laughs last. March 5th, 1942. It was a rainy day. I just came back from the boxing match. Bahamansu fought a damn good fight. He won by KO in the second round. It was the best boxing I've ever seen by him. Wani won by decisions. He missed a lot with his right. Charles's fight was forfeited. The teenager spent most of his days training with friends. Some tasks were more interesting than others. Interesting news from back home in Oklahoma came in the mail. March 12, 1942. I received a card from B. Now I have a niece. What do you know? We resumed our submachine gun class until 4.30 p.m. Tonight, I went to the fight with Dabi. Charles won by decision. March 23, 1942. I received a card from Anna Darko from Dad. The little girl was named Carol Elizabeth. I checked up on general appearance of the vehicles and went to the eye clinic and received my glasses. April 9, 1942. The Bataan fell today. After dinner, I went riding with Parker. Gee, we had a lot of fun. I'm feeling very good. Taxi and I are still signing in every hour. April 28, 1942. 
I received a letter today from my sis, Vivian. April 30, 1942. Charles loaned me five bucks. I was in time for Reveille, then I just walked to the chow line instead of making a run for it. After formation, we had orientation on the Norwegian and Lowland Nazi campaign. I got paid at 11 this morning, and I cleared $34.95. I collected $6 from Ottadayo and $2 from Parker. May 7, 1942. I mostly gold bricked all day. I walked post number 4 from 8 to 10 last evening, and then again from 2 to 4 this morning. I slept all morning after having chow. Parker received a letter from Ina. May 30th, 1942. Payday is tomorrow. The machine gun class was up fairly early for chow and formation. The whole class fired for recon. Junior scored 92, Charles 84, Parker 82, Dick 84, Olta Daivo 79, and me 86. We came back about one, then I just loafed around with Olta Daivo all afternoon. Young men far from home with cash in their pockets go to town. They go to the movies or find something or someone a little more interesting. June 10, 1942. I met a gal named Dottie. I was going to see her again tonight, but the accident kept me from it. Boris and I got cut by an exploded paint container. I received a cut on the chin which required seven stitches. I'm staying home tonight. I'll see Dottie again. June 19, 1942. I went to town last night and saw Dottie, but things didn't come out as planned, all because of a cute blonde named Joyce. I had a very good time. I met up with Wani, Garana, and Elgin. Rumor has it we're going across the pond this coming fall. A rumor that turned out to be true. At the time, Saw Pity didn't know that he and the other Comanche co-talkers would play a significant role in D-Day almost two years later. Letters from home continue to lift his spirits. June 23rd, 1942. I received a letter from Dad last night. He sent a picture of my brother Dan in uniform. He also sent a picture of Floyd's daughter, my niece, Carol Elizabeth. I almost cried when I saw the picture. July 8, 1942. Southwest Pageland. We're on maneuver for two months and today we traveled 186 miles. We came through Augusta, Aiken, Columbia, and Camden, and some other small towns. It rained like hell about 3 p.m. Hank got very wet, but I remained high and dry. Wani and Budro are on guard. I'm going to sleep in my Jeep. It's been a rugged day. August 1, 1942. I went to sleep with linens and the old bunk felt very good. I had breakfast, stood police call, and cleaned my Jeep part of the morning. I cleared $51.68 today. I paid soldier $4 for Charles. Bob Holder went to town. He didn't have any dough. We couldn't have very much fun. He went to see his girl. August 7, 1942. Parker and I went to the message center to do a little painting. He sang a good song that I'm going to tell Ina about whenever we get home. August 28, 1942. I went to the USO show last night. It was a good show. After Reveille, we went to the theater to see a film on mechanized fire. After dinner, all the boys were called by the commanding officer. Parker, Charles, Yake Etsai, and Tabi Yetze will take four weeks of intelligence training. September 17, 1942. I have a new title, Corporal Salt Pitan. I didn't go to town last night. I just wrote names in my album. October 2, 1942. After the 1330 formation, the boys were called out by the commanding officer. We studied our special code all afternoon under Lieutenant Dunaway. Mahikobi is leaving on furlough. October 8, 1942. Today was a very common day. After Reveille, we loaded into the vehicles and just waited to move out. We moved out at 1245 and arrived at our destination in the vicinity of the Stapleton Wren area. We prepared our own meals, which consisted of rugged corned beef hash, peas, and pears. We dug foxholes and slit trenches. It was a quiet evening. 
After months of training, the newly promoted Corporal Saw Pity boards a westbound train for some R&R. &R. October 12, 1942. Home sweet home. I arrived in Oklahoma City at 0730 and took a bus to Lawton at 0815. I arrived in Lawton at 1155. I got a haircut, met George, Benna, and Jesse, and then took a yellow to Fort Sill Indian School. I met Rowena and asked for my little sister, Vivian, but she was out in the field. I paid the school personnel a visit and finally caught a ride to Lawton with Bull and Toot. I'm at home now. October 16, 1942. It's another cloudy day at home. My nephews Jimmy and Melvin came over early. After dinner, Melvin went hunting on the hills with me and my brothers, Carney and Floyd. We captured one small rattlesnake. We didn't find any bigger reptiles at the den, as expected. We hunted on top of hills and came home late this evening. A prayer meeting was held at home by Reverend Leon Mota. November 8, 1942. Nothing unusual happened today. There was a line for the buses, but I finally arrived to town and bought postage stamps at Walgreens. I also sent the Kodak to Brother Floyd. I met Booth, Dobby, Holder, Van, and Karina. I came home and copied code in day room until 04.30. November 22, 1942. I went to bed early. Sergeant Shannon brought a rooster home and placed it on Yake at Sai's bed. It raised a merry hell, which woke up the whole barracks. I woke up for dinner at 12.15. I had only a dime left, so I played blackjack with the boys. After winning 55 cents, I went to the show. November 24, 1942. I was hardly gold bricking. Wani is on furlough. I spent a hell of a cold night in the field. I found my peyote button. Thank goodness. Oh, praise Allah. The Comanche co-talkers know why they are training. A day that no American alive in 1941 will ever forget would change their country forever. December 7, 1942. The bombing of Pearl Harbor, Honolulu, Hawaii. One year ago, remember. December 8, 1942. The formal declaration of war on Japan and the Axis countries happened one year ago today. December 26, 1942. We went to the parade field for the singing contest. We did lousy while practicing, but we were on the ball out there. What did he know? We won first prize. December 31. 1942. Dear Diary, the past year has brought me few happy moments and has widened my scope on life. May this coming year bring me great success. I'll let my conscience guide me. I know what to expect during actual combat. Old year out, the new year in. Saw Pity and the Comanche Code Talkers would experience combat throughout Europe. A Code Talker close enough to see enemy troops and tanks with his own eyes, risking his life, relaying what he had seen, and one on the other end, forwarding that vital information to the officers in charge. Several of the Comanche Code Talkers were wounded in battle, but they all came home, proud to have served their country their mission accomplished. The code they developed on their own was never broken.